Hey everyone, what's going on? My name is Alex Mitchell, and this is the first episode of the Good Art Podcast. I've been working in the arts mainly as a curator and organizer for just over 15 years, and I run a small gallery in Melbourne, Australia called Backwards Gallery that's entering its seventh year. Putting on so many projects and exhibitions over those years, I've been lucky to enjoy some amazing conversations and some really insightful conversations with some fucking amazing artists. And every time I walk away from those conversations, I'm just a little bummed out that I didn't find a way to record them so that I could share them with other people. And essentially, that's the whole point of this podcast series. Just a way for me to take the opportunities that I have and the conversations that I have and share them with you and hopefully create a platform that uh, will help us all learn something new about art. The central idea behind this podcast is the question, what makes good art? Both in terms of what makes good art, with the emphasis on the word good, that is subjectively assessing art, its quality, its function in society, and all of those other aspects of art, but most importantly, what makes good art, with the emphasis on the word make, that is understanding the artist behind good art, their lifestyles, their routines, what inspires them, their outlooks and their practices. And that's kind of what I really hope to get to the bottom of as I interview artists in this podcast. Ultimately, I think for a lot of artists out there, that's more inspiring than discussing art itself. I hope throughout the series, we get to know some really good artists and I hope that I can use this, uh, this platform to leverage my way up the art world and, and find myself talking to some uh, really inspiring people so that I can share it with you. But it's early days yet, so we'll just see how it goes. Okay, now if you want to follow me, you can follow me on Instagram at a.h.mitchell and also on Twitter at the same handle, but I never use Twitter. So with that being said, let's introduce our first guest. He's an Australian artist now living in Tokyo and also a co-curator and co-founder of China Heights Gallery in Sydney. His name is Mark Drew and you can find him on Mark Chronic. that's M-A-R-K-C-H-R-O-N-I-C on Instagram. I recorded this interview earlier this month in Shinjuku and I hope you enjoy it. Modesty is not my speciality. You see ourselves as fancy, sophisticated. Yeah, because everything I want to be yeah. about him, but I just finished eating a hamburger. The picture is worth more than a thousand words. Make good art. Here we are in the Shinjuku penthouse with Mark Drew. <laughs> It's kind of a good time to be doing it now. It's going to be dark in a few minutes. 40 minutes. Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. This is Alex Mitchell. Um, we're here on the Good Art Podcast. I'm here in Shinjuku with an old friend of mine, Mark Drew. Hey, everybody. <laughs> this is the first podcast in hopefully a long line of podcasts that I'll be doing with um, various artists that I know that um, has the aim of exploring ideas behind art and uh, the lifestyles that go into making good art. Super lucky to have Mark Drew as the first guest on the show. I've known him for a very long time. He's highly accomplished as a curator and an artist. He's self-taught, and that's gonna be the main focus of today's conversation. Um, what it's like to be a self-taught artist and any advice that Mark might have for other artists out there who are starting out and uh, haven't been through the school system and all that bullshit. Hmm. All right, so yeah, I guess I first met you what twelve years ago. Yeah, sort of early. Well, yeah, the first couple of years of China Heights and pre backwards era. Yeah. So yeah, you founded China Heights when? Uh, Ed and I put it together sort of the end of two thousand and three. Got the lease and just got building, and um, it was open early two thousand four. So still going today, wow. which is it's a pretty long time for an um, artist run space or whatever independent space. I prefer to say independent actually than artist run. But um, yeah, so obviously I've, I've been away for, this is my eighth year in Tokyo now. So it's um, it's Ed's, Ed's spot, but so, still closely involved. And Yeah, I guess we'll get into that in a bit, but um, I want to talk about when you guys started it. Um, what was, what was going, what was going on? Why, why start a gallery? Um, yeah, it's a good question, but Basically, same thing. Everyone says when they start something, they just there wasn't something like that there. So around two thousand one, two thousand two, like stencil stuff and you know cool art rather than just conceptual art sort of started. And Ed, Ed and I were both involved in that, but um, 
there was just little pop-up spaces and there wasn't a permanent thing. It was just like someone would rent a warehouse or rent a spot and do a, you know, an art on skateboards type show or something. And we were always involved in those. And um, I think I'd worked in the in financial services for five years before that and Ed was doing his job and we both just decided we don't want to have a boss. What can we do? And we're young enough to just see if it would work out and if it didn't, you know, whatever. We just kind of wanted to try something. So um, it went from like a little joke walking past an abandoned building like hey we should rent one of these and then we kind of just did I think we we're like 24 or something at the time and um yeah I just quit my job and Ed quit his job too and yeah we decided like the community was there but there was no effort to kind of grow like everyone was loved going to those events back then and uh Futura's book was out and Scroll and a couple of other things that they weren't really that popular yet, yet but people had them and we were kind of like, yeah, we want to develop this scene in Sydney a bit more. Yeah. There was like a, there was a real community back then of people who were like discovering this stuff for the first time and super excited about it. Yeah. Cause like, like the internet wasn't new then, but it was, um, it was still like cool to get an email from someone or you found someone's address, you could contact them. So we wanted to be like a physical space for that side of things where people could start to come and hang out and people could put shows together. And all of our friends were sort of making stuff anyway but the, the places you could show at just, they weren't really our kind of thing and our stuff didn't fit there. And the, and the one-off things were just a waste of time, you know, in the long run. So we just decided we could probably do freelance and do our own art and then make the gallery our actual, our thing or our thing for Sydney. Were you doing pop-up shows before China Heights? I'd organized a few shows. I did a um, 70s, 70s and 80s video game console show mixed with graffiti art that some other friends had been doing um, and a few little shows like that, but nothing serious. So yeah, I put on a couple of shows and I'd been in a few shows as well. Mm. And same with Ed. And China Heights was also a studio as well, right? Yeah. It's, it's a pretty big space. It's like yeah. it's a whole floor of a building. So um, a third of it was, or is the gallery, a third's the studio and third's like kind of photo, you know, our, um, our working space and photo studio. Hmm. Yeah. But yeah, still in the same location on um, Foster Street in Surrey Hills. Yeah, it moved for a while, but it's back <coughs> where it was. Yeah, well, you know. we, we kept the, the warehouse the whole time, but we tried a shop front for a year just before I moved to Japan. Um, the cool thing with the warehouse is like you sort of had to know about it. Like people knew about it, but it was a little sketchy. Like you had to go up some stairs and down a hallway and then you find this big, huge room. Like it was so big for a, for a gallery at that time. But we wanted to try the foot traffic thing and show the art to people that didn't actually know about our secret thing. So we got a space on, um, on crown street in Darlinghurst and we did that for a year. It was a whole different thing though. Cause it was so expensive compared to what we had before, but it was a good, it was a good project, but you know, like who, who really goes to an art gallery on like a Wednesday afternoon and stuff like that. Cause we were open all week. So went back to the weekends and then, if there's no show on at the warehouse, we could, we'd pack it down and just have it as our space hmm. or we doing private things in there or something. Yeah. And I guess, I guess for people who are either in Melbourne or overseas, uh, China Heights has since become a real institution for Sydney. And, um, I don't know, just in my opinion, it's one of the galleries that represents like, or at least if, even if it doesn't represent them, because there are a lot of artists nowadays that are like big galleries, it still, uh, represents the culture and the community that pretty much every like in my opinion, good, good artist in Sydney is a part of. So, yeah, I'm kind of proud of that. And I feel the same way. Like I've been gone for so, <clears throat> so long, so I can kind of look at it in a similar way. Mm. Going way back before China Heights, uh, at least I assume so you were making zines. Yeah. Working that was zines. a high school thing. Yeah. I guess for a lot of people, apart from your art and the curation, that's what you're well known for. What was it that got you into zines and, and yeah, let's talk about that. And then we'll talk about some of the stuff you learned from that. Yeah, well, um, the first scene I put out was on reviews of hip hop and graffiti, <coughs> photos of graffiti that I'd taken. This is in like 1994. And I didn't know the word zine. Me and my friend that made it from high school, we were just, um, we wanted to make a little magazine, we thought, just to make, uh, there was a record shop called The Lounge Room, which was kind of like a China Heights for us. Like you could, you go up these weird stairways and find this little hallway where you could buy cassette tapes and graffiti magazines and things. Anyway, we kind of wanted to impress them because we were like 14 or 15 at the time. <clears throat> and we thought, uh, we'll, 
we'll make something that we can sell or give away there. And when we took it in, they're like, oh, cool, a zine. And we're like, whoa, we, we never heard that <laughs> word. Like 1994, that word wasn't really that well known. So I always liked that I'd made one before I'd heard of that, that term. But uh, I'd found a copy to the school's photocopier key. I went, went to a private school and um, I really liked Parker Lewis and Ferris Bueller. Like they were kind of idols to me when I was <clears throat> like 12 or 13. And those guys definitely would have made a copy of the key. So I made a copy of the key. And it was a while before I knew what to do with it. But then it was like, fuck, we're going to make, um, make this scene at school. So I started running them off. And the zine got popular because, you know, we were, we were young kids and <clears throat> Duncan, the guy I was making it with, he was writing pretty imaginative reviews of hip hop and he was quite critical. And um, I think older people started to take an interest in it. And that's that's sort of what led to China Heights because I was like, it's cool being part of a community, but it's also cool um, actually being active in a community. So similar to like skateboarding when I was younger and punk and hip hop, like all the scenes that I really like are quite participative or whatever like anyone can get involved from nothing into just being part of it so that's what I wanted to keep going with China Heights which I'd learned from early Sydney hip-hop and early um early zine community type stuff talking about hip-hop and skate culture and graffiti when you were like 15 and starting this doing zines was yeah. there any like um notion in your head that what you were doing was like a precursor to art or part of art no, nah, I had no idea about art or like a path at all. It was just mm. when you're in year 10 in school, it's, you don't know about, or <laughs> I didn't know about that stuff at all. Um, you know, it's, it was the same for me. It's like, I remember when I was a kid seeing art as like this kind of like galleries and champagne. And it, I, there was always this disconnect between the comic books and computer games that I loved and the artists that I loved and what art was supposed to be. Yeah. Like those things weren't linked then. Like, now a 15 year old could know about a path or they could know about an exhibition or they could know about stuff. But in the early nineties, a 15 year old wouldn't know about that at all. Cause like the general public kind of didn't know about it either. It was just champagne and cheese at, a, at an art exhibition mm. and comics and stuff wouldn't be linked to it. Cause that street art thing hadn't really come into play yet. So art was more just art school kids, yeah. you know, from, yeah how I was looking at just art school weirdos doing their thing. And lowbrow was still underground, I guess, or at least no one had access yeah, to it. and not in Australia or, either. You know? like, I guess it was always around, but... Yeah. I guess since the 60s it's been around, but it hasn't, there hasn't been a connection. Yeah, and it just it wasn't easy to find out about unless you were down yeah. with that crew. Yeah. <clears throat> but definitely didn't think about a path or think about a next issue of a zine either Looking back now, in, in hindsight, like always you can see the, you can see how the path went. And it makes sense now, but definitely 23 years ago, I hadn't plotted this at all. So we, we, we started, we talked about making zines in, as a kid and then essentially taking that same attitude and opening China Heights. Yeah. What were some of the first artists that you worked with in China Heights? The Yok. He was probably oh, the, the first show. Oh, wow. <clears throat> We'd done a few little fashion things because it sorry, it was like fashion district. And at the time we were paying for the space, which was like 60,000 a year by renting out studio space to fashion people who were cutting their fabric and doing cut and sew stuff up there. So we'd done a bunch of fashion things first and little launches for them. But the first actual art show I think was the Yoke, hmm. who yeah worked with you guys doing he'd graphics. Be, he'd and be a good dude to get on this because he's an active guy. Yeah. I wonder where he is right now. Hong Kong or Singapore last Yeah, I he heard. travels a lot. So he was based in Perth at the time and um, he came across and that was the first show. Yeah. And then most of the other shows were kind of either our friends or for a while it was anything goes. Like I was managing it and any email that came through, we're just like, yep, yeah, all right, you're next Friday, you're the Friday after, you're the Friday after. And it was, it was kind of, the, the nickname was Friday Heights, not China Heights. And it just became super the regular thing, which that's the main thing I liked about it. We sort of took that art gallery idea of cheese and champagne or whatever and invited our friends and kids that were younger than us as well, like teenagers that would never go to an art gallery. They started to come because it was free drinks and a lot of people complained about the free drinks, but that, that's a big part of a Friday night mm. party gallery, which we kind of were in a <clears> way <throat> like we took it seriously, but we're so young. So yeah, that seemed cool to us that all of our friends want to come and we used to do gigs and bands up there too. And, 
that kind of got us in a lot of trouble, which it was lucky to. Well, especially in <laughs> like the reason that's so successful in Sydney is that the licensing laws are just really screwed up. Yeah, especially back then. Yeah. But like that aside, younger generations were starting to come who would never would have looked at the art and they probably didn't look at it for the first year. They were just there to hang out and go out the back and smoke or whatever. But over time, now we're 15 years old or whatever, those people eventually started buying stuff or even if they didn't buy, they were just appreciating and they started to be down and slowly those guys would begin making art or bring art to show me and Ed and some people we kind of fostered a bit and other people we just felt like was actually helping the scene grow outside of us. Mm. So yeah, I like that regular kid, dirtbag kids just slowly got exposed to that. I love that idea about a cultural generator that you yeah. can create this sort of institution that just create that generates culture in a community. Um, yeah, it like, sounds whack to say it, but that's yeah. that's kind of exactly what it is. Like it, it's just like yeah, you people come in and they drink and they hang out and then they start creating ideas and making art. Yeah, you, you start to see the same people around, or maybe they'd go out afterwards because we were doing a we were promoting a bar or a, like a sort of club night or whatever later on and. People would kind of follow the chain, and we were we had our little Friday night in that in that postcode, yeah, cool. in a few different locations, which yeah went on to Oxford Art Factory, which we're still involved with now. And you started making art during this time, or before this time, or because because of the zines, like I kept doing that all the way through into my twenties, and I still make them now, you know, just for fun. But through the zine culture, there was. Um, there's a few festivals to do with that. And when I started making my art, I was like 20. It was like terrible, terrible shit. But the same themes as now, like 90s hip hop was always based on music references. Um, hey, what was the question? Um, when did you start making art? Was it yeah, during right. the China so, Hide stuff? Or? Yeah, when the, the zines sort of thing, you can't make zines all, all year or whatever. You just sort of do them when you want to actually make one. So because of the books I mentioned before, Futura's book and the Scroll book and <clears throat> a few other things that came out. I wanted to make stuff like that. So my early things were stencils, like around 2000 or 99, around that at that time. And because of the zine, zine community, they had a bunch of festivals that would show that stuff and have zine fairs. And zines were getting pretty popular around 2000. And I'd sort of already had a head start. So I began showing my artwork there and just trying little things. And I think when we got the gallery, the self-taught, part of the gallery or the self-taught of being an artist was um, before I left Sydney in 09, I kind of curated or produced or assisted on more than 200 exhibitions. So the amount of people I got to work with in that time and the amount of artwork I saw or saw how things were made or finished or framed or stretched, that was kind of the, the training for me, just hands-on producing yeah. other people's shows. So over that time, if I had a spare night or whatever, because usually you're cleaning up Pierce and you're hanging shows and you're dealing with buyers and you're dealing with artists who want to show or whatever. In my spare time, I'd start to make little things that were kind of zine-based collages and stencil-type things, the same stuff everyone was making in 2003 and 2004. And that developed into the cassette tape stuff, which is sort of the first thing most people know of me, like just paintings of cassette tape spines. So I was doing graphic design at the time and that was like a, a way to just design something or mess around with fonts but turn it into art, which at the time I was hesitant to say I'm an artist because I was doing graphic art basically. And I think... What do you, what do you think changed uh, for you to be able to say that you call yourself an artist or a graphic artist? Well, then I was still doing a bit of freelance design but I always kind of hated it. Like I had regular people I work with and would do t-shirt graphics here and there and then painting on the side. And I think slowly it went to not doing freelance design or design at all, or maybe doing design on the side. And I was painting a lot more full time when the, when the tape stuff started. So I think when the flip went from painting on the side into being my main thing, I was like, oh, this actually is my main thing. I can't keep saying oh, I'm a graphic designer because I don't actually do graphic design anymore. So, yeah, around that, around that time with the cassette tape paintings, started actually realising this is how I make a living. 
But I think when I was younger, my idea of artist, again, with the cheese and champagne, if, if you tell someone you're an artist, they're just like, yeah, but what do you really do? And I just, yeah. I couldn't be bothered defining it. So just like, oh, yeah, I'm a graphic designer because it's easy to just throw someone off and not have to go into the next question is always like, oh, do you use oils or acrylics? And I was yeah. like, what a stupid question. Who cares? I just, yeah. <laughs> I think I think that's like one of the biggest things stopping people from thinking they can be an artist is kind of this weird misconception. Maybe like kids nowadays don't feel it, but definitely our generation, which was like you kind of picture someone in a smock with a palette. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's an artist in that you know. era. <laughs> I wanted to be cool, you know. I didn't want to be, uh, yeah, I'm this wacky hippie artist, Yeah, <clears throat> which is what I thought artists were. So, Advice for up-and-coming artists nowadays who are deciding whether or not, let's just say they're, in, they're still in high school and they're deciding whether to pursue like academic art or to just uh, sort of do it themselves. I guess that they both have got a lot of merit. So it's, it, I don't really want to make you choose between one or the other, but let's just say one decides to like forego the universities and, and teach themselves. What, what, what would be your main advice? Yeah, well, I work with people <coughs> that, that have gone both ways and, um, as long as you have it inside you to, to actually do or you've got something that you want to put out there or something you want to say, like, that's the main thing. It doesn't matter if you go to school for it or not. I was lucky because we had the gallery already and I was surrounded by properly trained artists as well and, and self-taught people. So it wasn't really something I had to work out. It just kind of was around. So it's very rare. I think you can get to where I'm at now by just literally doing it yourself in your spare time. So that's why I think art school or proper training is good if you're not really sure and you're young enough to still work that, that thing out. Like I'd already, like I said, well, I'd worked in the bank for so long already and um, I was already mid-20s before I even started doing something in the public or putting my artwork in the public apart from the zines. Hmm. And the zines were done under an alias then as well, so that was the other thing. It wasn't really as Mark drew until I started doing the gallery and then started painting. So... Um, Definitely, if, you, if you're young enough and you think you want to be an artist, art school is probably the way to go. But <clears throat> I can't hate on DIY either because, no. like, it's been DIY for me since the very start. And DIY is another thing that conjures up, like, a hippie image or, like, a some Punk guy out gardening. Something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, okay. No, you're right. It's, <laughs> a dude making, like, a It's a very punk, punk thing too, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking of bunnings, um, sausages yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Basically, just don't sit at home in your bedroom you've got to go out and go to exhibitions and start to meet people just see what the community that I was talking about before see what it's actually like and if you actually want to be part of it or if you can see your art hanging on the walls or I don't know like things things kind of change a lot with Instagram and the internet like there's a whole generation of people that really don't see the need to actually even show physically anymore like that's a kind of weird thing to notice but I'd notice that I don't know, in the years I've been going back to Sydney on holidays, there was kind of less exhibitions and more people were able to get by without doing it, which for me, I would never stop. Well, I say that now, but I don't think I would ever stop doing physical exhibitions, like proper shows. I really like that buzz and I think most mm. people do, but for younger people, like there's so many more opportunities now with Instagram style things. Yeah, but I think that can only go so far at the end of the day. It's like... You can have a following of 200,000 people and sell zines out, but there's something to be said for creating an experience that people can come to and yeah, put yeah, work definitely. on walls. Well, both of us as art gallery owners would yeah. <coughs> would stand by that, and I, I stand by that now. And I, I look forward to doing a couple of solo shows every year and being in group shows and things, even just to catch up with friends. But I love planning a room and planning works to fit and stuff like that. Hmm. But, yeah, I think it's important for people just to – actually go out to shows and see what or to exhibitions sorry and enjoy that side of thing and visit museums too sort of yeah absolutely start to think about what people have done in the past and what you can build on from that like you're not starting from zero like you're if you want to be an artist you kind of you've got so much history to build on and you've got so many case studies you've got so many docos on youtube to watch and um yeah i mean you don't have to, as an artist you don't have to uh try and be a part of like a lineage of artists but there's so much art out there that's been doing exactly that, that if you do decide to like try and pick up a dialogue that someone else has started 50 years ago, mm. or at least the scene has, it's like, 
uh, you don't have to, but why wouldn't you, you know? Yeah. Um, there's just so much cool shit. Yeah, well, that's the whole thing for me. It's just, it's fun. I, I yeah. love doing this. And um, when I realized I could do this for for my life or whatever, which I'm nearly 40 now, so it's a pretty solid chunk of my life. But when I realized it could actually be my life, <clears throat> that was amazing to realize, you know, just kind of have fun and make, make cool, cool shit. Do you have like a, do you have like a work routine during the week? You're just like, fuck it. That's it. No, nah, kind of no routine at all. Like I've been on holidays for a couple of months because last year I did, no, it's 2017 now. I did yeah. so much stuff last year and shows in exhibitions in different countries and projects in different countries. And I traveled a bit. I was making kind of back to back different bodies of work and a lot of commissions in between. So the last two months I haven't really done much and I've just moved house from basically the countryside into the middle of the city, which is where we're recording this podcast right now, looking at Shinjuku City. Which has this incredible sunset over it right now as well. Yeah, which my old view was a little tatami house, like a, the Japanese mat style house, looking out over the river, in out way out in the burbs. So yeah, my routine's a little different right now. But generally speaking, the last couple of years, I think sometimes we'd work all night on paintings or you'd stay up for a few days just making everything in a, in a really small amount of time, then travel with the show, come back, take a bit of time off, and then try to not stay up all night and, you know, get up early and have a regular routine. But, yeah, really, it's it's so case by case, depending on what you've done the week before, if your body can take it. Again, because I'm getting older, I really don't want to stay up all night. But sometimes it's so fun just working on a painting or something as sun rises, so... Definitely there's no schedule since I stopped doing graphic design. Before I was a bit more prompt with email replies, but now I'm sort of, like I live in another country and I'm kind of a ghost here as a foreigner. So I live on this weird fringe, which probably every artist, once you start doing it for a living, you're going to be on the fringe somehow because people have that beret palette <laughs> opinion of you. So it's like, oh, that's that, that's that artist. Um, so yeah, I think, there, I think there's no real routine. I think that's really encouraging for artists who are listening because it's really easy to sort of uh, flagellate yourself um, when you're not working to like some superhuman routine and um, to hear that artists, other artists um, have kind of flexibility is a really good thing. Yeah, it's super flexible. Yeah. Like if I don't feel like working, then I don't have to say yes to a show, but I want to be showing, so... Thing. Mm. It's it's pretty flexible. You can kind of say, oh, I could do a show in May or I could do a show in June or whatever. So you can, you can kind of set your main points for the year and just work around that. But yeah, cool. yeah since dropping doing design stuff, um, it's kind of just up to me. And like I'm, I'm DIY and I'm very self-starter. So sometimes yeah. lately I've switched to waking up at 8 a.m. just getting everything done because I love looking at this view. This the last week I've been in this new studio. Does the sunrise... Whereabouts does it rise on this? Other, uh, yeah, directly across. Man. So, yeah, I'm getting up kind of early here. Um, but yeah, all that aside, like, just... Um, yeah. <laughs> it's flexible. That's okay, the bottom yeah, line. bottom line. It's, yeah. Very, it's very flexible. So if you've got a part-time job or something, you know, in your initial stages, that's probably the way to go. But you really got to give up the dependence on money or the dependence on someone else to give you money, mm -hmm. which I was kind of happy to do because the first five years of the gallery, I mean, it didn't make a cent, but the first five years we made enough to cover the rent and I, we kind of got used to living like rats. Like we never had a grant, which I think that's why it's lasted so long because other spaces it gets grant or I don't want to talk about other spaces. Mm -hmm. For us personally, we've never had a grant or any type of funding. It was yeah. just paid for by us and the work we put in. So that's really lasted with me to this day. Whatever I put into oh, something, maybe, that's maybe what's that going to take us back. Just back to this uh, school versus DIY. Do you think that people have a better chance of getting grants if they've been through the schooling system? Yeah, definitely you do. But like, I see that as a trap in a yeah. way. If you, I don't want to be in any system, let alone a regulated system where you have to sort of achieve a certain amount of result or you don't even achieve results you just have to tick their boxes i don't want to be ticking yeah. other people's boxes that's why ed and i quit our jobs and started this yeah of course if you're not our type of mentality then a system's the way to go but yeah. for us personally we'd rather be operating how we want to operate mm. 
<clears throat> yeah, and that's not to romanticize being a self-starter or having a, a non-conformist mentality. It's just the way you are. Yeah. A lot of people work really well within systems and kill it. So yeah, yeah it I comes, guess, it comes I guess down to the... just has to look at themselves and say, how can I make this work? Yeah, that's that's actually the bottom line. How can you make this work? If yeah. a system's the way to go or some kind of support? Like, yeah, I, I can't do amazing sculptural projects because I don't have like a $50,000 grant. But for some people... Like that's amazing that stuff. I mm. love it too. But it's not it's not our style. I like yeah. it all just coming from from us basically. Yeah. And I, I become instantly belligerent as soon as someone tells me what to do. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how we ended up like this. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I don't know if, if you really want to touch on it, but I, I wanna get some thoughts about art, what makes good art in your opinion and what are some of the good artists that you, you look up to and um, what do you think maybe the role of art might be in society? These are all big questions. You can answer yeah. them however you want. You will um, not answer them at all. Well, I did art history up until in high school level. And I know whatever I've come across since then. I've never really yeah. studied it. And like, I'm not a scholar in that, in that side of things. I've just been doing the stuff I started making at 15. I'm still doing at 40. So to me, good art that crosses into that 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 term good art just means mm. something you want to look at again or something you'd go back to see or something you're still thinking about when it's gone. Uh, something I posted on Instagram recently was Kami, Japanese artist. Like He's one of the guys in the scroll books that I've been mentioning a few times. Th those books, by the way, like they were a big, they were like a group show published into a book, basically. And it was the first time I'd seen like massive street art style murals and things around 2000 or whatever. Oh, you might hear the... 5 p.m. bell 5 PM ringing bell. outside in Japan, a daily routine here. Okay, that's my one routine, this 5 p.m. bell going off, <laughs> yeah. letting everyone know to go home for dinner <laughs> on these giant loudspeakers around. But anyway, um, something I posted recently was Kami skating his installation in Mori Art Tower in Rapongi, which is a, a contemporary museum, like 50 flights up. He built, him and his wife built a skateboard ramp up there and painted it and um, this is six years later. I still think about how cool that was, like, once once a week he would go there and he, him and his friends would session the, the place. And that's not like normal art, but to me that, that was sick. Yeah, totally. So something like that just either doesn't have to be different, it just has to be like it's weird to use the word cool, but I make cool stuff and I want to see cool stuff. I don't really care about the technique or especially living in Japan, like you can give a pencil to someone here, anyone, and they can do an amazing exact replica of Mickey or they can just do a cool sketch just out of nothing and I can't really draw that well but I'm not too fussed with technique which is why art school didn't appeal to me because I didn't really care about that training I just cared about how the final thing looks so yeah maybe it's a bit more throwaway than most people would answer but I just I don't know if it looks cool at the end then I'm I'm kind of down with it for my art and for other people's art too yeah, I don't think there's an answer to that question at all. It's why it's a good one to ask because... Um, yeah, right, take up a couple of minutes of the podcast. Yeah, it just, it just sort of eats up time and I can chill. Yeah. But, but apart from that, it's also, I think, just the fact that it's so subjective makes it makes it a good one to ask. And I think maybe once this podcast is hit, like hopefully, you know, touch wood, 100 episodes or something, hmm. we'll have like 100 different opinions on that question that might give someone the ability to extrapolate the true meaning of art. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> back to the DIY thing. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to say I don't really care, but I'm not that. I don't really pay that much attention to other people's things. I'm just. Um, well, there's Kami and. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like my crew and I like what yeah. I like, but I basically just think about what I I want to do and I do that, and that takes up my my waking hours rather than yeah. sitting around like pondering art and the meaning of life and stuff. Although I might do that from this balcony from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're almost wrapping up. I've got to, I want to see if there's anything else on here that I haven't touched on. No, not really. I wanted to sort of have a bit of banter about what it's like living in Tokyo. Cause we both, we both have a complete love affair with this place. And mm. I've been coming here for 10 years on and off and you've been living here for yeah. eight years. Yeah. yeah. This is the start of the eighth year, man. It's the best city in the world. That's all there is to it. Yeah, I always thought I'd want to live in the States, but um, every time I've been there, I just exhausted and pissed off by the end. Yeah. 
No, I think it's the fact that you don't know what's going on. That's one of the most charming things about Tokyo. It's like you can't, the nuance is lost on you. So it's just, yeah, it's easy kind to, of like an outline, which is great. Yeah, it's so easy to just do my thing here and not have someone bugging you. Yeah. All right, man, I think that's it. Um, people who want to get in touch with you and, and check out your Instagram, what's your Instagram? Uh, are you recording still? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just um, freestyling then. Yeah, well, that's, that's actually kind of the best way, huh? All right, uh, Instagram. All right, it's uh, Mark Chronic, M A R K C H R O N I C, or makingends.com, and the gallery website's chinaheights.com. Yeah, and you should check it out. And um, yeah, that's it. All right, everyone, thank you for sitting through our first ever podcast, and, and thanks to Mark for making it happen. Oh, yeah, and no diss to the States if I end up living there. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> place. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you very much. Um, see you soon. Bye. Thank you.